talk about open source value. So first off, a quick disclaimer. The ideas, the ideas and opinions expressed in this presentation are my own uh, and not of my employer. They do not, uh, I am not in a position to officially sort of speak for my employer in any capacity, so just wanted to put that out there. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, so I started my career here in Asia in investment banking uh, back in 2005. Uh, I then switched to law and practiced here in China, in Southeast Asia, in Hong Kong. In 2014, I returned to the United States uh, and I joined Facebook last year. At the company, I am on the m and team, that's mergers and acquisitions. I also support technology and intellectual property licensing and uh, I'm of course also on the open source team. So at a high level, I think we can all agree what we've seen over the last maybe five or 10 years is that open source is maturing, right? It's, it's, it's no longer a question of when uh, companies will adopt open source, like all companies or most large companies will adopt open source as a question. It's, not, it's no longer a question of whether, it's a question of when now, right? Companies have begun to realize that that even traditional, even companies that have nothing to do with technology, they all need to become software companies. Everyone needs to invest in software, and accordingly, everyone needs to invest in open source. Uh, companies like Microsoft, that have traditionally been a sort of not necessarily a friend to open source, have also really changed their tune, right? In you know, enterprise DevOps, they've doubled down on open source for the acquisition of GitHub, and so things have changed significantly, right? Uh, I talk a lot about open source. I evangelize about open source internally within my organization. I talk about open source outside my organization. I engage with the Linux Foundation. I engage with open source program offices at about a dozen other companies. Uh, and as I am talking about it, and the more I talk about it in sort of in 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 the last couple of sort of. You know, the more I talk about it, I'm finding that there is a issue that affects the way that we all talk to each other within the community and versus how we talk to folks outside the community. And as we broaden, as the appeal of open source broadens to outside what we call the community, uh, we will find ourselves having to talk about open source, the value of open source to folks outside the community more and more. And I want to talk about a little bit about my experiences in that respect, and one of some of the blind spots that I that I think we have as a community. So I'm going to go into a little bit of an exercise. I'm going to give you the, the five or ten minute spiel and, and our standard uh, sort of the way that we, we typically talk about open source at Facebook. I'm going to give you that presentation. Right. I obviously have a point to make. So as I'm going through my presentation, you can kind of think to yourself what the point that I'm trying to make is at the end of it. And of course, I'll take comments at the end and, and we'll go on from there. Uh, so, open source at Facebook. Um, across the company, we have 516 active projects. We have about 300 projects that have been archived, but 516, approximately 500 projects that we're supporting actively. Um, you're probably familiar with a lot of our major brands, uh, you know, uh, Across all of our repos, we have approximately just over a million followers and um, 357,000 commits uh, from 16,000 contributors. Uh, and of course, you probably are familiar with our headline projects, React, yeah, React Native for mobile, and uh, PyTorch. Right? Those are probably our biggest projects. Why we do open source? So at the company, we do open source for a couple of, five or six big reasons. Uh, the first, first and most important reason is that at the start of the company, a lot of our infrastructure that allowed us to scale to where we are today was built on the LAMP stack. That's Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Right? And so at a fundamental level, we would not be here today, we could not uh, have, have had the successes that we've had today without those fundamental open source technologies. And so 
essentially we feel like we owe the community. We feel like we owe it to the community to contribute back. So it's sort of like an obligation to contribute back. Second of all, open source, from our perspective, when you create a piece, when you create a product or create an internal piece of internal infrastructure with the decision to open source it from day one, the code naturally becomes a lot better. It's kind of like the process of me having to prepare this presentation, having to think about it, maybe it's better or not, right? Um, but ideally, theoretically, you know, you know, preparing work for public scrutiny should make it better, right? And that in turn leads to better design, better APIs, and certainly better documentation. Um, finally, and, and in addition to that, at the company, we also feel that in addition to providing engineers with time off and all the things that we need to make them productive, uh, we also want to give them opportunities to work on their open source projects that they themselves are interested in, right? That may not necessarily re sort of relate to their team's core goals, right? So this is an open source project that they are interested in themselves. They want to work on that. We want to give them the opportunity to do that. And that's another why reason. So it's, it's, it, it allows them to sort of develop their skills, but not necessarily, you know, sort of in, in a different context. So it relates principally to productivity. We think that that's a good investment in the long term. And of course, in the sort of personal careers of a lot of our engineers, open, you know, one of the things that may be necessary, one of the things that may be helpful is open source helps uh, our engineers sort of develop their personal careers in uh, connecting with their industry peers, uh, talking about you know, showing off their work externally, uh, you know, and, and all of that. And, and this is, open source is, is a mechanism to allow them to do that, allow them to speak at conferences, allow them to collaborate more freely. Strategically across the company, we also have a number of other sort of larger goals, right? Um, you know, there's a high level goal of trying to change the world for the better. Um, that's an example of that is our connectivity project in which we are trying to lower the cost of internet uh, across the globe. Um, for our, we do also do a lot of fundamental research, a lot of basic science research in the AI and ML space. We release a lot of those results to the public, uh, the models and some of the data sets uh, in, you know, as consistent with you know, scientific method, scientific process to allow peers, scientific peers in the industry, research institutions, academic institutions to reproduce those results, right? And therefore sort of advancing the, uh, the, the progress of science in general, right? Um, and overall, we, we, we think of that as helping to generate community, community goodwill. Uh, and then more broadly, we think about things in terms of, you know, so, so, so what I just talked about is leadership, but there are interplays with that between people, right, recruiting and, and brand, right? So recruiting is one where, for example, where you make something an industry standard, um, in the case of React, right? React having become the industry standard, uh, it helps us recruit the best engineers. It also reduces our training trip costs because the folks who we recruit come equipped and armed with React, and, and, and that's just a little bit of a, extra training that we don't have to do if we're the ones sort of uh, creating the industry standard. Okay, so I'm gonna open it up. Um, what are your, what, so when, when I first saw this presentation and when I thought of this and when I started giving this, this really resonated to me personally, like on an emotional level, right? I thought, wow, this is, this is exactly, as someone who lives and breathes open source, this is exactly where I wanna work. I'm really happy to be here, this is great, right? And so uh, I'm gonna open up to the audience. What are your, some of your thoughts when you see this presentation and what are your immediate reactions? Does anybody have any thoughts? Anybody? I have an agenda, obviously, when I, when I talk about this. All right, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right into it, which is um, if you look at these goals, right, contribute back to the community, give to engineers time off, showcase our technology, at, at, you know, discourse, share our research, uh, the principal 
th there's, an, there's an issue that here that, that, is, that is sort of pervades a lot of the sort of the way that we talk about open source more generally, which is, first of all, most importantly, these goals are not applicable and not necessarily compelling to companies outside of Facebook, right? So if you think about your organization or you think about most organizations out there that may or may not be software force first organizations, and you go to your manager and you say, well, I want to showcase our technology excellence, right? And, or I want to do this, or I want to do this, I want to build goodwill. Like, what's your manager going to say? The, the manager's going to say, uh, so where's the value in that? Like, how is that going to help me? How is that, your manager's probably going to say, how is that going to help me get promoted, right? Like, like, like where, what, what exactly are you talking about? They probably think that this is a bunch of like marketing speak, right? And, and so, so that's, that's, that's kind of like the first, you know, the more, the more I gave this presentation, the more, the more I thought about this, right? And this is, I think, more problematic in the case of Facebook because Facebook doesn't connect open source to revenue goals, right? A lot of companies make money using open source Facebook does not do that. They don't make money using React. They all, we obviously benefit off, off of it, but there isn't a direct P&L, there isn't a direct bottom line uh, sort of end of the quarter, kind of quarter analysis. Um, and so what I realized is that, end, ended up, that ends up resulting in us, you know, as a community, when we, when we talk about these open source, it ends up resulting in us taking a lot of these core values for granted, and we then assume, or we impose, or we, we sort of assume a certain initial value to open source collaboration, which may not necessarily be there, right? And so, let me get into some sort of examples. And so when I, I recently had um, another example where I recently had a discussion where I had to explain the benefits of open source collaboration with a team to folks that were outside the industry, right? And um, what, what we kept running into is this question of how do you quantify the values? Like, what are the numbers? What are the numbers behind uh, the specific thing that you're talking about? So something really basic, like when I, uh, if I, if I send upstream a feature to merge into upstream for a piece of software that I use, right? Like, what is the value for that? What is the value of not maintaining my own local fork of that piece of software, right? How much developer time am I saving? Like, well, what is that exactly, right? And, and sort of, there, there are folks on my team who got a little bit frustrated because uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't have those, those immediate numbers to pull out. Like, well, how much, how much are we talking about? Right? Similarly, when you flip that downstream, right, when you provide open source parts of your stack and your customers are then sending uh, pull requests or sending features upstream, right? And uh, in, in sort of one of, what somebody on my team then said, well, well, that's, you know, that's, you know, we don't need to provide that value. We don't need to provide those numbers. Uh, the, you know, that's kind of like asking the question of how much money do companies save by using Linux? Everyone knows Linux has become the default standard. It's used by all these companies around the world. We save so much money from using Linux versus having to build our own operating system, right? Everyone knows that. It's a fundamental truth, right? And, and that's, that's where I kind of took that back and I realized that asking for the numbers, asking for us to quantify, that is not an unreasonable request, right? And we should be doing that, you know, even at the most fundamental levels. And so, I think that in order to sort of broaden the appeal to, of open source to companies that are traditionally not in the ecosystem or companies that don't necessarily are, are have familiar with our ethos, I think the way to do that is, first of all, to, uh, to talk about it in a way that is universally compelling to folks outside the industry and to talk about it in a way that appeals to them, right? Um, which is really to kind of think about it more like a product, think about the costs, think about the benefits in a way that, gen that, that is compelling to them, right? And so the first thing I, would, I, I think is, is necessary is to kind of start by quantifying our base assumptions about open source, right? So, um, you know, we all come to the table with a basic assumption that all open source activities are valuable. 
They may not necessarily be in every instance. They may not be right for every business case, right? And I think it's important to be kind of honest about that, right? And so you can think about it in terms of developer time. I right? can think about it in terms of marketing, right? So you know, it in, in the United States there, you know, there was this there was a show, a very popular show, and in the final episode or one of the final episodes of the show, there was like a Starbucks mug on on the table. Right, and it became a big sort of uproar about how oh you know there's a Starbucks cup and you know it, it, it sort of it, it, it detracted from the, the reality of the television show. But but there were you know as soon as that went live and went viral, marketing firms started to estimate what the value of the marketing of that accidental Starbucks cup was in that episode. Right, and so if if they can do that, if somebody can go and estimate the value the marketing value of accidentally putting a Starbucks cup in a television show, you can also estimate the value of, uh, of an open source project, right? Quantifying it through stars, quantifying through other things. Now granted, there, there are certainly a lot of assumptions that need to be made, right? But I think it's better to do the math, make the assumptions, than don't try at all, right? I think, I think it's better to at least try to do the work. Uh, you know, recruiting, um, so at Facebook, we do surveys of people who join the company, and we, uh, you know, a sizable percentage of them cite our open source program as, uh, as the reason for, for, for them joining, right? So, so surveys are helpful for that. Um, and also to look at upstream and downstream, right? To look closely at the projects that we are contributing to upstream, and also the ones that we are maintaining and providing downstream and also collaborations. And then from there, it's, it's to, you know, take a, taking a look at all of those things, measuring the, uh, what you're getting out of it and then what you're spending on it, and then actually thinking about whether it actually makes sense in the context of your business, in the context of your organization. And then from there, it's, it's the next step is to define specific measurable objectives, right? In a lot of open source program offices, the objective is to promote open source, the objective is to promote adoption, the objective is to sort of, uh, is to sort of augment or enhance someone else's objectives. A lot of times they're related to marketing, a lot of times they're related to sales, but typically those goals are, 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 are vaguer than you'd like them to be, and they're certainly not your own team's goals. They're typically goals that are owned by someone else, right? And so it's really important to be specific and more important for those goals to be those driven by your own team. And from there, I think it's a process of finding new things to open source. And uh, that is, you know, that applies in two contexts, right? So one context is your software stack. The other context is the software stack of uh, the ecosystem around you, that software stack that you use, right? So there is open source in, in all of those areas and it's a question of where can you find that value? Um, and so, yeah, it's either open source piece of, current piece of technology you have or build it from scratch. And so the first part of this is to look for the technology in question, right? And so this, I think, just to kind of Kind of preface or introduce this. This is what I think you know is 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 one methodology for how to think about open source as a product, right? Is to start building it from the start like a product, right? And the first part of that is searching for what the product will be, and that's the technology. And so if you take the assumption that each piece of each piece of closed software creates friction, creates technical debt, right? You have to if you own a closed piece of software, you have to own the bug fixes, uh, you have to own compatibility, maintenance, there are legal restrictions around it, um, there's misalignment of incentives between you and your customer. If you, if you take that assumption as a start, um, you're, you, you wanna ask yourself, what is the value that you get from making a piece of closed software open, right? And of course there are limits to that because it can't be someone's crown jewels, right? It can't be your organization's crown jewels. It can't be 
your, your supplier's crown jewels, right? And so that's really, really important. You, you, you know, you're not going to necessarily get anywhere where you're gonna be laughed out of the room if you go approach someone and ask them to open source what is the differentiator for their company. Uh, and then from there, it's a question of you know, finding the actual specific technology that serves the goal, right? And so here, it could be anything, right? It can be an SDK, um, not necessarily an API, but if you expose certain things as part of your AP, you know, as part of your stack, you can create SDKs around that, you can create open source products around that, glue code, examples of how your product works, things like that. So this is of course how Facebook thinks about it, uh, about the things that are impactful within the company, but you yourself will have to fill in what is impactful for your company and, and do the analysis from there. And from there, uh, you look, you, you sort of figure out what, um, along these three axes, right, what the rationale is in your company, right, and what the technology is and whether it exists. And probably a fourth axis is who owns it, right? Is it a technology, is it a piece of technology that you currently own or you will build? Or is it a technology that someone else owns and someone else will build? And from there, I think you would probably do the most important part of this, which is quantify the impact of it, right? In terms of efficiency, right? So cost savings, product value, customer adoption, customer retention, or other intangible benefits, right? So. Here, I think, is a good, uh, good time to kind of zoom out and give you kind of an example of what I'm talking about when, when, we, when, we, when we talk about going back and re-examining a piece of software. So years ago, I had a client in sort of the CRM space, and they, they had two sort of aspects of their business, right? They had one aspect, which was the core on-prem uh, on -prem CRM, ERP, right? And then they had sort of an evolution into cloud where they were moving into cloud. And then on top of that, they had a professional services arm that was principally charged with migrating, migration of data, getting data in the correct format that was usable for their CRM. And they, and they were competing um, both this, in the CRM and the ERP space in a highly competitive field. And professional services, the professional services arm of their business made money, right? That was, you know, but it was very sort of labor intensive and it didn't make a ton of money for given 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 the requirements and more importantly uh, but they they sort of maintained it because it was necessary for onboarding customers and getting customers to buy into the product going into the cloud this client of mine recognized that given that the cloud is the future right uh, and given that the sort of professional services arm was solving a problem faced by not only them, not only their customers, but also the customers of everyone else in the industry, right? Because uh, data conversion and all of these tools uh, are, are sometimes, you know, they're solving a problem that is, 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 is typically a huge headache for IT departments. So what they decided to do is they decided to open source and also create a software stack around all of the migration tools that are necessary for converting legacy data into readily, sort of easily readable format, CSV, whatever, right? And so they open source all those tools and then open source a ton of documentation to show, uh, and, and the automation behind it to show their clients how to use those tools, right? And then they then arm their sales teams with that information, right? And so it puts the sales teams in a position to go to a customer and say, hey, even before you spend a single dollar on my services, here's how I can help you, or here's how we can help you solve a very, uh, a problem that affects or implicates your, your, your company right now without you ever having to buy anything from me, right? And that, that, in that situation, that was a very, very compelling pitch, and that was very successful for them. Now, granted, they sort of cannibalized, that the act of that cannibalized their professional, service, professional services arm of their business, right? Um, but that was not the future, right? And so that, that involved a lot of very careful weighing of what the current value they were deriving from a business and how that fits into the broader strategic roadmap and how they could sort of convert the current value or convert the current 
close pieces of technology to customer value, right? And so that's the kind of kind of analysis that that is uh, that I think would be you know is helpful and, and also compelling in a way that is you know that we don't traditionally talk about. And I think the next step part of this is to is to do this type of analysis is to weigh weigh all of these considerations, weigh all of these equities, right? And so when you talk about adoption, like how much adoption, you know, whether when you're, when you're talking about open sourcing either your own product or asking a vendor to open source their product, how much adoption are we really talking about? And is it worth it, right? Um, most critical question is, does it harm my product's distinctiveness, right? Is it harmful in any way to what my company is doing? Uh, and it, is it, it, does it undercut our business goals? Uh, another important question is how much does it help competitors, right? Open sourcing technology uh, lowers the barrier to entry for other competitors or would-be competitors who are looking to break into the industry. Um, what is the maintenance overhead? So just because you open source it, even though it's probably less expensive and less overhead than keeping a piece of software closed, you still have to maintain it, you have to monitor uh, the repository for, you have to accept PRs, you have to merge PRs, you have to review them, issues, comments, whatever, right? There's, there's, it's, it's not completely free, there's still a maintenance cost to open source. Uh, and does it impact other teams? A lot of open source is driven by, especially in large organizations, is driven by a specific team, uh, not necessarily, who has not necessarily gotten buy-in from the entire company, right? And so it's important to find a process to do this, but it's still lightweight. Um, and does it expose, important problem is, does it expose data or processes, right? Does it expose, does open sourcing the thing expose certain things about your company that, uh, that you, that other, other, other folks in the company would have problems with you sharing? And finally, there's a host of sort of other legal concerns. Um, and from there, you, you go on to the pitch, right? Uh, on top of that, I think there are additional kind of benefits that uh, we don't often talk about, which I see in my day-to-day, -day, which I also want to talk quickly about. Um, so, on the legal side, we process a lot of joint developments, right? We process a lot of closed source collaborations with a lot of companies, right? And that's just a normal part of what a lawyer does. A lot of these, you know, so on one hand, we have these, you know, joint development, joint collaborations that take months you know, potentially years to get off the ground because you have to negotiate an agreement, it's really long, it takes a long time to get approvals and whatever. But on the other hand, you have the open source side of things. You have, which are basically the same exact activity. The, on the open source side, it's the same exact activity as what's happening on the sort of closed source side, but it's just one is open and one is closed, right? And so one of the things that is interesting about, that I found interesting from the legal perspective of open source is that in a, lot of, in a lot of ways, it's actually a sort of a loophole to the otherwise sort of, you know, pretty sort of thick barriers between companies, right? Open source is a way for you to accelerate the speed of collaboration without jumping through a lot of the internal things that create transaction costs. And there's also value in that as well. Um, and I think the ultimate goal from that is to do shared development across different companies, right? Is to, uh, you know, have your company work on a specific part of the problem and another company work on another part of the problem. And so even if open source, you know, one of the things to think about is even if open sourcing something does not end, for whatever reason, for if you go through the analysis, if it doesn't result in, uh, in a decision to, in a decision to, you know, for whatever reason, maybe because of competitive reasons or maybe because of, other reason, if it doesn't result in a decision to, 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 to go through and execute on it, um, it's important to remember that it, it is one of many options for collaboration, right? Uh, and so within, within the ecosystem, there's, there's open source, right? And that's, that's, that's the most open one. Um, there's also, if, for example, so some of my teams will want to open source something, but then we'll run into a problem, right? Like a confidentiality problem. Um, it's pretty simple, right? Uh, if, it, if it doesn't work for open source, then, then, then you, if you increase the friction a little bit, you know, 
put an, put an agreement around it, you can you can you can you can do that. You can achieve the same business goals, but you just need an agreement around it, right? Um, public foundations is another thing, right? When you, when you need to collaborate with multiple parties, uh, creating a foundation around it sort of defuses a lot of the costs involved. Okay, and that is it. That's my uh, QR code for WeChat. Um, thank you for your time. Any questions? Questions, comments? No? Okay, well, uh, thank you. Um, have a good rest of the conference.